Hey, it's a Humble Collector here. And in today's video, uh, we're going to actually be taking a brief look into the history of the U.S. Tank Corps during World War I. Uh, last week when I did, did my uh, unboxing video where I got a new Sun and Service flag, it reminded me that I had this one for the Tank Corps, which is really interesting and cool. And I've been meaning to do a, t a video on the U.S. Tank Corps and what they kind of did during World War I uh, for a while now, just because I think this is a neat flag and a, a good way to kind of talk about that. Uh, there was one source I used heavily, which looked like it was somebody's maybe academic paper they made back in the 80s. Um, back when I answered questions about this flag originally for a friend of mine, because he answered questions about the tank core, I saved it. I'm going to try to see if I can find it again online and put the link down in the description below. Uh, so if you're interested in getting some more information about the early development of the tank core and the training they did, uh, that'll definitely be a good source. Uh, without further ado, let's get started. Uh, so the U.S. Tank Corps began in June of 1917 uh, when General Pershing assigned several committees to study tanks. Now, of course, the British and French at this point were using tanks uh, to quite a decent degree. The British, of course, had their heavier land ships. Uh, the French, of course, had the Renwalts, uh, as well as a couple other models. Now, these committees basically found that there was value to the tanks, even though they were having a lot of mechanical issues. They were still helping to affect breakthroughs. They were really good uh, weapons for demoralizing the Germans. Uh, and so there was definitely something that was worth pursuing there. So they also analyzed all the tanks that the uh, British and the French were using. And they determined that the British heavy tanks and French light tanks like the Renwalt were deemed as possibly useful to the U.S., while tanks like the, uh, the Schneider and the saint Chamond were considered unsatisfactory. Uh, the main reason for that being that those weren't so much tanks as they were like armored you know, self-propelled guns, basically. And the committees who studied these tanks decided they were just too lightly armored. Um, they relied too heavily on infantry protection, and they weren't really what the, uh, the U.S. was looking for. So on July 19th, uh, Pershing used these reports to order the creation of a tank board to study the selected tanks, you know, the British heavy tanks, the French Renwalts. And on September 1st, uh, this committee submitted their report that determined the value of the tank for the war and the need for a tank department in the U.S. Army. Uh, this department was going to report directly uh, to Pershing. Uh, they also determined, again, that the Mark VI tank, as well as the Renwalt, would be you know, satisfactory for the um, uh, U.S. use. And they also determined the U.S. was going to need probably about 2,000 light tanks and 200 heavy tanks, and they were going to need to be able to replace 15% losses per month which seems like a lot, but uh, I'm not really sure on uh, statistics like this. Both France and England agreed to provide plans and uh, also s tanks for the U.S. to study so they could actually start making their own in-country. Uh, U.S. tank production would never really reach that level during the war and actually relied a lot on French and British production uh, later on. On November 10th, George S. Patton became the first U.S. soldier officially assigned to tanks, uh, which is really awesome, actually. So the reason that Patton became the first tanker in U.S. history is because he actually put his name in for, for the job. Uh, and he ended up being chosen because he had cavalry and machine gun experience. Uh, his logic being that, you know, these light tanks are like cavalry. Uh, you know, that, that kind of works there. And then a lot of the light tanks that the French were using were armed with machine guns. And he had experience working with machine guns in the past, so he knew those. Uh, he also spoke French very fluently and was able to read it as well, which would help with translating uh, technical documents and training manuals. And, of course, he was an aggressive commander, which he felt was necessary uh, for his role, uh, basically as the start of the, uh, the tank corps there. And because of this, when he was chosen, he was ordered to establish a tank school at Langres, and him and his assistant, First Lieutenant Elgin Brain, uh, received two weeks' instruction at the French tank school at Chamblien, because neither of those two actually had any first-hand experience with tanks. So they went to the French school, spent a lot of time with the instructors, instructors there, watched the training. Uh, they ended up actually going for a tour of the Renwalt factory and actually suggested some improvements that the French actually took and adopted, uh, such as a self-starter for the tank and a bulkhead between the engine and the crew compartment uh, in order to prevent you know, fire from spreading and burning the crew. And in his initial report after this, Patton proposed that light tank platoons consist of an officer and 15 enlisted men. Uh, these platoons would have five tanks, one with a three-inch gun, two with six-pounders, and two uh, with machine guns. 
Companies should have three platoons and also a company HQ section. The HQ section would consist of two officers, 51 men. Uh, the company should also have a signal tank, a command tank, eight supply trucks, five ammo trucks, two gas and oil trucks, uh, a baggage truck with a trailer, a kitchen truck with a trailer, and one automobile and two motorcycles. Uh, battalions would consist of three of these tank companies, as well as a section, as an HQ section, and a repair unit. So, pretty interesting. This was the standard, you know, setup that the tank corps would actually use during World War One. They ended up taking most of what Patton said uh, to heart. Uh, Patton also noted that light tanks uh, should be treated more as heavily armored soldiers and not as like their own separate uh, military unit. Basically, he thought they should be in amongst the infantry, kind of supporting the attack and helping to break through enemy lines uh, in that way. Now, it's around this point that Colonel Rockenbach uh, joined Patton and Brain as commander of the tank force. Now, Rockenbach and Patton did not have a super great relationship, especially early on. Uh, it did kind of warm up later on. You know, they realized they had a lot in common, even though they didn't always agree with each other. Uh, but the relationship was never super good uh, at that point. Now, the first officers who were assigned to the tank corps uh, arrived at Long Grace on January 8th, 8th to begin training. Uh, there were a lot of issues with acquiring land for the U.S. to train their, their tankers on, uh, which helped to delay things. There were a lot of issues with the training of the, the light tank units. And eventually, you know, Pat was in charge of the school, and as you can imagine, he ran a pretty tight ship. The men didn't really uh, like him. He wasn't very popular uh, at that point. And so... One of the other issues they had, they weren't, didn't have a lot of tanks to actually train on. So getting tanks for the U.S. Tank Corps was actually a big problem throughout the war, unfortunately. Uh, so they started training officers at this tank school. And eventually the first set of crewmen, about 200 of them, from the artillery of the 42nd Infantry Division, arrived at Long Race on February 17th uh, to begin training. And it's at this point training really takes off, and you have the first light tank battalion of the U.S. Army organized on April 28th with Patton as its commander. And interestingly enough, the three-color uh, pyramid, pyramid insignia of the tank corps that you see a lot on World War II stuff was actually put together uh, during World War I by 2nd Lieutenant, Lieutenant Will Robert, Robinson. Not Robertson. Robinson. And he actually basically just kind of put it together in the evening, ran into town, had 300 patches made, and Patton really liked it, and it evolved over time. But he was actually the one who designed it. Now, in June... Uh, the school had actually developed a nine-week training program by this point, and it consisted of courses covering mechanical theory, military intelligence, as well as gun training and physical fitness. So it really became like an all-encompassing uh, program at that point. Now, while all of this is going on, uh, it's worth noting that there were heavy tank crews being trained in England. However, they were being trained by British at the British tank schools, so they didn't have the problems that Patton did in France, really. Um... Interestingly enough, though, they had a ton of volunteers. The volunteers for the 1st Heavy Tank Battalion actually took the Olympic over to England. They arrived at, at uh, Wareham on April 9th. And originally, they were going to be equipped with Mark 8 tanks, which was were supposed to be a joint venture between the British and the Americans. Basically, a British design with an American engine in it. And they didn't really have those ready on time. So those men, when they actually got to the front of the Rhine, on August 30th, they were equipped with British Mark V's uh, instead. Now, the light tanks units were American-run. They were, you know, in the American chain of command. The heavy tanks were actually being used by the British. They were in the British chain of command. So the heavy tanks the U.S. had during World War I weren't really ours. They were, being, they were British tanks that we were being used as part of the British military at that point. Now, U.S. tanks first see action uh, during the Battle of St. Mihail on September 12th. And it wasn't a super great start. Weather was really bad. Uh, a lot of tanks were actually not able to actually get into the fight because water damaged their engines. And a lot of them actually ended up getting stuck in the mud. Now, thankfully, Battle of St. Mih Mihail, um, the Germans actually started withdrawing the day before the offensive began. So fighting was relatively light. Uh, these same... Uh, light tank units eventually took part in the Meuse-Argonne offensive uh, as well later on. Now, the heavy tanks uh, that were under the British chain of command, like I said, they were to suffer very heavy casualties during the Battle of St. Quentin Canal, uh, and they would later go on to 
fight at the Battle of the Cell uh, as well. Now, during World War I, there were two men in the U.S. Tank Corps who were awarded the Medal of Honor. Those were Donald M. Call and Harold W. Roberts. Now, Donald M. Call received the Medal of Honor for rescuing the officer out of his tank after it took a direct hit that apparently knocked off half the turret. Uh, he bailed out of the tank into a shell hole, then determined that his officer was probably still alive, went back to the tank, pulled his officer out of it, and then proceeded to carry him over a mile through enemy artillery, machine gun, and sniper fire back to uh, friendly lines, which is quite impressive. Uh, he ended up living into the 80s, actually. Now, Harold W. Roberts was actually a tank driver, and during an offensive, he moved his tank up to try to cover a tank that had been disabled and ended up sliding into a shell hole that was full of about 10 feet of water. And the tank ended up getting completely submerged. He knew that only one of the men in the tank, these were two-man crews on the, uh, the French tanks, uh, he knew only one of them could get out. And so he basically told his gunner, well, only one of us can get out, and so out you go. And then proceeded to uh, throw him out of the back hatch and ended up drowning uh, in that shell hole as well. So yeah, the, the American tank corps during World War I didn't really see a ton of action until the very closing months of the war, but it planted the seeds for what the U.S. tank corps would be during World War II, which was this really excellent military machine that was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with German tanks throughout France, uh, as well as you know German tanks in Italy, Germany, you know, throughout the Western Front. Now, as for this flag itself, this is a really odd sun and service flag. Uh, so obviously, the person who this flag represents was in the tank corps. Uh, this is a very stylized British-style heavy tank that you see here. And I have not been able to find a single other one like it. So I'm not sure if this was a piece the family had custom-made or if this was actually mass-produced. And it's very fragile. But you can see the design actually goes through to the back there uh, as well. Yeah, the dealer that I got this from, who I've dealt with many times in the past, uh, he'd never seen another one like it. I haven't been able to find another one like it, so it's definitely a really unique piece. And it gave me a chance to talk about the very beginnings of U.S. armored warfare, uh, which is really exciting. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, please leave a comment down below. Love hearing from you guys. Uh, thank you all for watching. Happy collecting. And I will see you all again very soon.